Hey there, everybody. Alec Chrisman here, your relevant TA for Poly 231, Intro to Political Theory. I owe you a Hobbes and Locke video, and I'm really, really glad I do, because the first week of this course, couple weeks of this course, were handy. It showed how ancient Greek debates had real serious relevance for modern pressing political issues. I think that's a useful thing for any political theory student or potential political theory student to learn. But now we're moving into kind of that old-time religion. We're moving into the classic political theory. We're moving into the social contractarians. This is sort of like the the play free bird or the anyway here's wonder wall of political theory. The good core theorists that are really easy to compare, contrast, because they're all contractarians, but they all have very different premises and come to very different conclusions. So I wanted to go through and talk about the two contractarians we dealt with. Both offer some different ways of looking at them, some other metaphors or ways to explain their theories that I found useful from my undergrad experience, and then also uh, clean up some stuff that I saw, some confusions on the discussion boards, stuff like that. I'm also going to put a little bit about Rousseau at the end of it. I'm not going to give a full spiel on Rousseau because I haven't actually got to watch Professor VMF's lectures yet on it. I'll be doing that as soon as my food shows up. But I wanted to at least, like, seed a couple ideas as I understand Rousseau. Ideas then questions that might become discussion questions in the discussion boards this week. But I wanted to seed those while you're reading Rousseau. Keep that in mind as you're looking at him. I think that can be really useful because he is both, I think, the best writer of the three by far, and he's also, in my opinion, the strangest of the three by far. So that's important. I wanted to give you some groundwork, a couple things to sort of organize your thinking around so you're not just hopping in blind. Though hopping in blind can be fun sometimes. Um, but first, I want to talk about do some housekeeping stuff. Most important thing, thing you're probably the most curious about, the papers. My goal is to get the papers back to you by the 8th of March. I know that's a long turnaround time. The main way I would normally do this in a course is I would just buckle down. I have more students in this kind of a course than I normally would teaching it. And so what I wanted to do was normally I would sit down for two weeks and I would just knock that out and get the papers back to you ASAP. The problem is in my own work, I have a non-negotiable deadline on February the 28th to get this paper submitted for publication. If I don't do this, it's going to cost me a lot of money. And I've already asked for an extension on it, so I can't push it back any further. So there's kind of a two-week chunk right in the middle of when I would be working on your papers. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to grade half your papers this next week, then spend two weeks working on my own work, and then spend the first week of March wrapping up grading the rest of your papers and applying them, putting them online. This isn't going to affect you as much as you might think. We normally don't get the discussion paper topics or the paper topics out for about until two weeks before the next paper is due. That's usually the idea. And so you won't be able to work on a paper, obviously, until you have the topics ready to go. So that's the thing. My main goal is I want you to have two full office hour sessions in between when you get the papers back and when you have to write your next paper to make sure that everybody has a chance, as many people as possible have a chance, to come in, talk about their papers, and connect that feedback to how to improve on paper number two. So that's the goal. That's what we're going to do. Uh, look for 8th of March is my goal on that. So with that being said, another thing I want to say, keep up with the readings from now until when we start looking at the next paper. It's going to be really tempting, given how hard and fast this class started, to kind of back burner it for a little bit and focus on your other classes. And I know you're going to have to do some of that. I get it. Like, no judgment on my end. It's just that political theory is really, really hard to back burner. Constant, steady work is going to do a lot more for you than trying to cram political theory. You kind of can't cram political theory, as many of you might have discovered, having tried to cram Hobbes and Locke while also trying to write your papers at the same time. So given that, I'm happy to have a little bit of time to go over Hobbes and Locke for you in a bit more detail. So let's move to Hobbes. Let's talk about Hobbes for a second. Take this or leave it. If you're happy with your understanding of Hobbes, you don't need to integrate this. But if he's still kind of not entering your brain right, and I get it, here's one other one that helped me in undergrad. One of the important things to understand about Leviathan, Hobbes' Leviathan, which I think is maybe the greatest work of political theory in the English language. That doesn't mean it's right, but I do think it's just an incredible, incredible work of theory. It doesn't start with human nature. It doesn't start with a state of nature. It starts with physics. It starts with the idea, 
from Hobbes' perspective, that we are a physical system, the human body. We take light into our eyes that communicates information to the world about us. This light kind of bounces around in us and sort of knocks loose desires in us. We see the light reflect off the apple. The apple enters our body and our body goes, ooh, an apple, I'm hungry. And the hunger produces a physical drive to move towards and grab the apple. And then you have the apple and you eat the apple and that produces energy, which then allows you to move towards the next thing you want. It's very Newtonian. It's very materialistic, which is handy in a way, because as we'll get to, that means it doesn't have a ton of assumptions, a ton of moral assumptions to it. All you kind of need is the idea that people want things and will come into conflict with others. And in the same way, if two people are moving towards the apple at the same time and his hand gets first, I still want the apple, so I talk, but if I need the, if I'm starving, I reach out, try to grab, and then he grabs me, and now I'm defending and we're fighting, and that's how I kill a person in the state of nature. It's this natural idea of us all as kind of billiard balls. And people that talked about Hobbes' relation to IR, you're right about this, though. To be fair, a lot of theorists are really snobby about the way they use Hobbes and IR. They basically only use Hobbes to talk about anarchy in between states. So, in general, I thought people that brought that up were completely correct, but a lot of theorists can get snobby about that, so fair warning. There's more to Hobbes than just the billiard ball thesis. But here it really applies. It's these people with these motions moving into each other, and they collide, and when they collide, people die. People get hurt. People get injured and can't repair themselves, can't heal themselves, because there's no time for any kind of industry, any kind of knowledge to build up in a state of nature. You need the state to provide the stability in order to get the kind of industry that allows knowledge to last longer, that allows arts of healing to be devised, that allows people to form governments and systems of private property that could, in theory, give them rights. But the rights come from the government. The rights are not innate in the person. So that's one way to understand Hobbes. And it gets away from one of the things that I was, I was seeing a lot of people talking about. Hobbes doesn't say that people are particularly selfish. He, he doesn't, he doesn't, Hobbes has a pessimistic view of what life looks like in the state of nature. He doesn't necessarily have a pessimistic view of human nature, or at least you could read him other ways. You can read him pessimistically, so that's not necessarily wrong, but what's important is he's not imagining that everybody is just brutal, selfish, they only care about themselves, they're only out for themselves, it's this kind of very, you know, brute, dog-eat-dog kind of a thing. Imagine you're, you're out in the wilderness and you're scared, and you don't know who's coming around the corner at you, and you see somebody, and you've been attacked before by someone. You've been hurt before by someone who showed up and threatened you and took your food. And so you see someone coming your way, what do you do? Do you walk out and shake hands with them and make a good friend and suddenly bond against the state of nature? No, probably not. You probably sneak around. You probably watch that guy. And you're probably hungry enough because the last guy took your food where you go, I'm going to go and I'm going to take this guy's food or this gal's food. I'm going to really go and get that person because I need to survive, not because I'm selfish, not because I want the most for myself just because I'm greedy, but because I'm scared and I don't know where my next meal is coming from. I think that's a kind of different sort of attitude than what some people were interpreting Hobbes as saying. They were interpreting him as saying that people are intrinsically selfish, acquisitive, and he might believe that, but I don't think you need to, to be a Hobbesian. I don't think you need to believe that in order to take on board the idea that life in the state of nature would really suck to take on board the idea that it would be really hard and you would be forced to do self-serving things if only 10% of the population is out there in the state of nature being brutal and conniving and hurting people, that's going to incentivize everybody else to treat everyone else like a threat. Because you don't know if you're going to run across that 10%, right? I think that's a little bit more of an intuitive way to look at it. And it makes you understand it's not like Hobbes say people bad, Rousseau, as you'll see, say people good. That's n it's, it's more complicated than that, I think. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about, the right to resistance in Hobbes. I had a couple students talking to me as though Hobbes has a pretty broad right of resistance. And I just want to emphasize, re-emphasize something Professor VMF said in, in the Q&A. Hobbes allows a couple limited conditions for when you're allowed to resist the state. Remember, the state can put out a hit on you. The state can say, we're going to come kill you. 
The state can even show up and try to grab you and kill you. But you can resist. You can resist when the state comes knocking on your door to take you to the executioner. But nobody can help you. Put it another way. If your girlfriend, if your boyfriend, if your son, daughter, child has the state come for them, they can resist, but you can't help them fight back. Because the state hasn't broken the contract with you. The state has not threatened your life in any way. Additionally, if the state comes to imprison you indefinitely, you can't resist either. It really is only immediate threat. Or, as Professor VMF talked about, there's also the question of uh, immediate bodily... Or if the... Um, if if the if you're in a uh, city that's being attacked and the soldiers have broken through the gates and the sovereign has lost all control at that point the contract is broken you are no longer being protected by a sovereign and by the government the sovereign sets up and the rules the sovereign sets up so at that point every man for himself every woman for themselves throw your shields down and run you know that's the kind of once the city is broken that's the other point where the contract is void but it's really just those two conditions hobbes is known as the or absolutist for a reason. He's known that way for a reason. So I wanted to keep that in mind. A lot of students were citing him as a good source for arguments for rebellion against the state. They were saying, you know, if you think your life is in danger, even a little bit, you're allowed to resist, go out, start shooting cops. He does not see it that way. And I worried about that when I heard a couple of that. So I wanted to clear that up. Another thing, um, I saw a lot of people talking about how Hobbes's sort of selfish view of human nature, which we've already talked about a little bit, not exactly sure that's the right term, but how it's sort of ideally capitalist. It's the ideal capitalistic sort of attitude. That's, again, not exactly right. And it's important with that because capitalism at that point would be a kind of anachronistic term. Capitalism as a mode of production didn't start coming around. It came around in the late 16th century, early 17th century, but it wasn't the kind of world that Hobbes is advocating. And it wasn't the kind of world that Hobbes was seeing in England at the time. England didn't really start to become capitalist and start to move to a capitalist mode of production until like about mid-17th century, or mid-18th century, early to mid-18th century. Hobbes is writing in the late 17th century. So careful applying those kind of anachronistic terms to him. It's also just important to understand like, you know, self, not all self-interest, not all selfishness, if we wanted to call Hobbes selfish and thinking that people were selfish not all selfishness is capitalistic not all self-interest is capitalistic right self-interest predated capitalism marx would tell you that and so that was just something to keep in mind make sure that we're evaluating these theorists on their own terms as much as possible interesting to compare it to that but i didn't want them to be conflated in that way so what's the upside of hobbes the upside of hobbes really is that things are simple the upside of Hobbes really is that you don't have to imagine this big god in the sky that gives people uh, rights. You don't have to imagine that there are these innate human things that everyone agrees on. You really only have to imagine that life sucks without a state. Easy to believe. Going out and building your own house, starting your own farm, all that stuff is really hard. It's really hard. And um, the... Other thing about it is uh, they, they, you also need to believe that people don't only want to sort of, like protect themselves. You, they might want other things, but all they're really gonna, all you need to believe, is that they need to protect themselves and that they want to preserve, preserve their own lives. That's not that much. That's a pretty parsimonious theory. It makes a lot more sense. It requires a lot fewer assumptions. The problem is then, from that theory, there's so little in the state of nature. You go to a sovereign, a, a state that can really do basically most of anything it wants to you, other than kill you. It can try to kill you, but you can fight back. That's a big jump. That's a hard, that's a hard outcome to look in the eye. And a lot of people don't like it. And so a lot of people, and I was happy to see when I asked, you know, every group, which is more plausible to you, Hobbes or Locke? About half said Hobbes and about half said Locke, right? It led to some really good conversations. I have to emphasize, I was really, really impressed by the conversations that happened on the discussion boards. I was really pleased. It was some high-level conversation that you folks were getting into while not monologuing, while not going on really long, you know, 500-word-plus posts, right? You were doing a good job. I was... I was really impressed with that, and so that's why I was able to get into some more of the weeds on these thinkers, 
because you had it locked down to a large extent. I was really pleased to see that. So in general, most of you are on the right track from what I can tell. So with Locke, moving to Locke, I want to ask, like, do you need religion to believe Locke? This came up in the Q&A. Do you need natural law? Do you need religion? Well, you need probably, you need rights. You need natural rights to exist if you're going to believe what Locke says about the government. What do natural rights require? What does it mean to say that somebody has a right to something even if they're alone in a forest by themselves? Even if there's no government to recognize that right? Even if there's no social institution or organization that would lead to people recognizing that right? What does that mean? Well, we've talked about natural law before, and we've talked about the idea of natural law as, you know, a shorthand for it being kind of, you know, shared moral intuitions that everybody has. And maybe you could get there with Locke. I could hear that, that all Locke really needs is he doesn't need a god, he doesn't need rights in a thick sense, he just needs us to have sort of shared moral intuitions. We all realize that when I take a branch and I cut it into a little carving of an owl or something, I've mixed my labor with it in some way, and therefore it is mine in a way where it would be wrong to take it, right? I mean, that's pretty complicated. So already we should start having some questions about how plausible that universal sense of property might be. But... You may not need God to get there, but I'm starting to think when I was listening to teaching it this time around and listening to Professor VMF teach it, you might need something a bit more than just kind of shared moral feelings, right? You need rights, and rights are trickier to justify than it might look. They might be very socially useful, and this is the main thing I wanted to highlight with Locke. Rights may be very socially useful. It might be very useful for people to believe in human rights. It might be very, a society that believes in the existence of human rights might be a much better society to believe in and values human rights, it might be a much better society to believe in and to live in than one that doesn't. But when you actually get down to trying to provide a grounding for them, life gets really hard and you're always going to have Hobbes over your shoulder going, why, where, where are these rights? Where did you find them? You're holding on to this, this, you're holding on to this little carving of an owl you made. You're holding on to this food that you gathered. I'm bigger than you. I'm smarter than you. I'm faster than you. I'm sneakier than you. You don't need to always be bigger to win in the Hobbesian state of nature, right? You can be stealthier. You can wait until the big guy's asleep, sneak up, bash his head in, and take all of his stuff, right? You can do that. So that's the weird egalitarianism in Hobbes, right? But Hobbes is always going to look at Locke and go, where are these rights? Tell me. Show me. Where are they? I don't see them. I see, when the government breaks down, Hobbes is thinking, I see chaos. I see people murdering each other. I see people murdering each other over different beliefs. And we just can't have war. We can't have war. He's so scared of civil war. And if I think if he'd lived through it, we would be too, right? I have a lot of sympathy for that grounding in Hobbes. But he's that, that if you're trying to justify natural rights in the state of nature, if you're trying to say that you have rights on a desert island with no social institutions or no government around to recognize them, no shared social beliefs, grounding them in some way is really hard. And Hobbes is always going to be looking at you and going, why, where, show me, prove it. And that's the trade-off with Locke's theory. I think Locke's theory is, in my own personal opinion, I think Locke's theory, I would much rather live under a Lockean state than a Hobbesian state, I'll tell you that much. But it's less plausible on the base level that it requires more things to believe for it to get up and running. You know, all things being equal, the thing that has more conditions to it is harder to set up. Locke's state of nature is harder to set up. Locke's basic theory of rights is thicker. It requires more. And that can be a little harder to believe in. That doesn't mean you don't believe in it. That doesn't mean you don't argue for it. But that's the way I understand there's a trade-off there. You get more, but it takes more to put in. And so that was kind of the, 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 the stakes of the discussion between the two as I saw it. One other thing, and I'm just going to go on this little tangent here for a second because I have time. Feel free to skip ahead. Uh, I had a student in the first time I ever taught this course ask, you know, we understand Hobbes was a really anxious person. Hobbes was uh, beaten by his father. Does that mean we have to take his political theory seriously? If he's Maybe he's just so anxious, maybe he has this kind of mental problem. That means that he has bad judgment, 
on these questions. And I want to both take that question seriously because, you know, when you read these theorists, you kind of get a sense of who they are, right? You kind of get a sense of the sort of people they might be and the the way they might look at the world. You know, Hobbes's anecdote that Professor VMF told were, you know, my my mother gave birth to twins that day, myself and fear. That's what he said. He was an anxious guy. But the question is, does being anxious, does having some kind of mental health issue mean that your logic is necessarily worse? Mean that your arguments are worse? Or does it mean that you can see things that maybe other people can't? You can be concerned about things that other people might kind of slide over in a more blasé way, right? You know, I deal with some mental health issues of my own, and my problems occasionally believing things that aren't true, to put it mildly, have led to me being very good and very focused on the problem of disagreement. They've led to me being very focused on, you know, I'm not sure that everyone believes the same thing. I'm not sure that everyone shares the same beliefs across every spectrum. You know, when people appeal to common sense, I go, sense isn't that common, it seems to me. My struggles with mental health, my, my own journey with that, if you will, um, led me to learn that and I think have a better insight on that question. So I think it's important to learn these theorists' biographies. I think it's valuable. I remember them better if I think about them as characters in my head. I think that's a handy thing to do and it helps me pose arguments between the two of them. But we shouldn't write any of them off because of some perceived pathology. Mental health issues can lead to people thinking badly. They can. They can also lead to insights that other people can't produce. So that's my little soapbox moment on that. And I think it's a good way of looking at it because we're going to be reading some odd theorists. Rousseau's an odd guy, right? I think it's important to realize that we don't write someone off because of oddness. That's important to me, both as a theorist and as a person. And so I wanted to get that on tape somewhere. Rousseau. I love reading Rousseau. Rousseau is very strange. Rousseau is very arcane. Rousseau is, uh, it feels like he's talking from a different universe sometimes. And so I just wanted to sort of plop down a couple things for you to think about as you read. One important thing is you can think about the three contractarians in this way. Hobbes is not democratic. Let's break up three terms. Let's decouple democracy, representation, and rights, right? Let's look at that. And let's think about absolutist government as a government that doesn't allow for rights necessarily. So, so those things are different. Hobbes is not democratic, and he's an absolutist. He believes that consent of the people is what makes government legitimate, what makes authority legitimate. But that doesn't mean democracy, right? So that's important. Locke is representative. It's unclear how democratic he is at times, but he's representative. He believes that the people have some say in picking representatives and having them go to parliament. That matters for him. And he's not an absolutist. He believes that there are certain rights that the government may never violate. And if they do, you have a right to rebel and instate a new government. Hobbes or Locke is not an absolutist. Rousseau is democratic he believes that democracy, it's a democratic process that produces legitimate government. And he's an absolutist. He doesn't really think in terms of rights. If the majority votes for a policy, if that policy was properly created via the process that leads to the general will, and via the population that can make use of the process that leads to the general will, then it goes. And it doesn't matter if it persecutes a minority. It doesn't matter if it violates one person's rights. He doesn't care. Rousseau is a democratic absolutist. A lot of times people watch Hobbes and they think about totalitarian societies, right? And they think if you're democratic, if you're an absolutist, you must be undemocratic. That's not true. Rousseau proves us wrong on that. You can be a democratic absolutist. Rousseau is one. So that's really important. And the last thing I want to end this video with is what is the general will? What makes the general will different from the will of of all. What do you need to make the general will? Because the general will is kind of this weird, alchemical, chimeric sort of creation, right? It was made of us. It comes out of our vote. And then it stands above us. And it can be used as an external standard 
to judge our actions. It is both of us and it stands external to us such that if you disagree with the general will and of laws produced by the general will, then you are wrong about what you think you want. And what you actually want is represented in the general will. And so you better take your desires and mold them to fit the general will, or else you're not actually following what you in your right mind would believe. That's a big triple axle for him to pull off. That's a very kind of counterintuitive paradoxical. Again, you get the sense of the personalities. Rousseau, I get the sense, loves paradoxes. He loves being able to say things like, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. God, what a good line, right? He's so, he's such a good writer. And I'm not saying this because I like his ideas. I don't necessarily, right? But I can admire good prose when I read it. That's what you want to look at when I, the, the two questions I'm most curious about coming into discussion sections with Rousseau. You know, what is the nature of Rousseau's government? How much power does it have? How, how, how obliged is it to the people? And what is the general will? What's the difference between the general will and the will of all? What do you need to get the general will? And is the general will plausible? I, do we appeal to it a lot? Are ideas like it a lot? I think these ideas are floating around, and I look forward to discussing them with you in the discussion sections. Thank you so much. Again, I'll put the little timestamps underneath so you don't need to slog through the whole thing if you want to get to a specific part, but thanks for hearing me out on this. I'm really excited to be moving to this next phase with you, and importantly, last bit, come to office hours. Come to office hours this week. A lot of people, office hours drop off when there's not immediately a paper coming up, and we got a decent long gap in between this paper and the next paper. Come on in. Let's talk about the theorists. Let's have those conversations that we kind of had to back burner while we were trying to do work on Hobbes or on um on our papers. Let's talk about Hobbes. Let's talk about Locke. Let's talk about Rousseau. Let's talk about Hume coming up and some of the people that critique the contractarians, right? Because we're going to get that too. Come on in. And I, I'd love to spend some time not going over citation requirements. Though that was important. I was happy to do it with you. But I love talking theory more than I love talking essay requirements. So come on in. I'll be happy to see all of you. Next office hour session is going to be same kind of time slot, same uh, time slot as we've been having on Thursday of this week. Group office hours from 3 to 4 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then individual office hours. Going to be a little harder for me to know how long these ones are going to run. You know, last time around, I had enough people to where I could keep doing them for three hours, four hours. Uh, this time around, I don't know if that many people are going to show up. I also might have to save myself a little energy that a six-hour straight day of talking to students kind of burnt me out a little bit. But I really do want to talk to you about this stuff, too. So come on by. I'll really try to get through the whole queue unless there's something really stopping me, unless I'm completely fried. So look forward to seeing you then. And yeah, thank you so much for hearing me out. I really hope this video helps. And I'm looking forward to this next week. This is going to be exciting.